Welcome to my new subscribers. I hope you stick around. I hope you are inspired to build one of these yourself. And I hope I'm not too unbearable to listen to. Just remember, I have to live with this every day. This is a moderately in-depth review of the single motor design, running it both as a hovercraft and with outboard wings. Here's the usual links they are in the description. First of all, in this configuration, what I don't have is the outboard wings on, and there's no provision for a horizontal stabiliser. It could be added, but not, not just now. So, this is a pure hovercraft. It's a rectangle. There's no other means of pitch stability. So that informs quite a few things about the design, which I will point out. Starting with the front, this is angled away from the direction of motion. Now, for quite obvious reasons, a completely flat front isn't great, and you could have it angled the other way. And the thinking being that oncoming air would be pushed underneath, give you ram air. But this is a, a kind of anti-ram wing design where, because I've not got much pitch stability, I need to discourage ram air, I deflect it away. I have built this with a, a ramp front the other way, and it just ruins the pitch stability. So this angle both deflects air away, away, and in doing so, it actually contributes a bit of downforce at the front, because of the reaction of the air bouncing off, pushes it down. As with the previous one, there's nothing really in here. It is just hollow. So I've got my servo mounts, and again that part is up on my thingiverse now, if anybody wants it. My pro rods are 1.2mm piano wire, so a little electrical terminal block there, which is really good for adjustment. My receiver is somewhat taped up, uh, which I'll talk about at the end. It's basically water protection, or partial water protection. Same with my ESC, is somewhat taped up. Rubber band to secure the battery, and again, that hook is on my thingiverse. This is a safety feature. That's one of the motor phase wires runs outside and can be disconnected. Again, I'll talk about it at the end. So the motor is 35481100 kV, just the labels come off. Something I covered at the start of my motors review was my typical running temperatures, like air temperatures are between 5 and 15 degrees C. Um, I have never run this above 20 degrees C ambient temperature, and at that temperature this was getting very, very hot. So, again, I covered it in my, my other video. If you live somewhere it's hotter, be wary of just blindly copying my motor and propeller selections. Likewise, if you're running, you know, freezing, below freezing, you could probably get away with propping this up a bit from where I, where it is. Stability duct. 
I will put this up on my Thingiverse um, to this approximate size. I know it can be scaled in the slicer, but I'll at least put something up. So at the back, the main thing is the straightening vanes. So without boring you with a bunch of vector mechanics, the air coming off here is going to be approximately radial. And if there's no vanes at the back, it would just fan out and you would have very poor thrust and effectively no turning torque. So the straightening vanes, as the name implies, are just taking that airflow, turning it so it's exiting straight back. I'll put up a picture which shows it under construction, which shows the idea. At the back, something that's not here is the subflap. This doesn't have a, a rear peripheral jet. It's just a plain flap, closed flap opens and that's it. I call this a, a forward optimised design in that, well, it's designed for high forward speed, not so much for hovering on the spot. So we don't really need... It could be added, but it wouldn't really be much benefit. So it's just a plain flap. Sealing this up against the, the rear is something of a challenge. This is an experiment with a 3D printed kind of lip to see if I can make it work a bit better. Again, I'll put up on screen kind of various approaches. Mm, not sure about this yet. The basic issue is this needs to clamp closed with a lot of force. Like it needs to cut that air jet off completely. That's the downside of not having a sub flap. This needs to be practically airtight. And the problem being it's actually feeling quite a bit of air pressure from the inside. So you need a lot of force to keep that closed. But it also needs to open out. Not fully horizontal, but not that far off in my experience. So you've got a trouble of a linkage needing a lot of... I guess you'd call it standing torque, like standing force, it needs to be able to really push that closed, pull it closed. But it also needs to open out far enough you know, to get your propulsion and your turning. It's not an easy problem to solve. Last thing before looking at the underside is the attachment points for the outboard wings. Again, on my thingiverse, various sizes available. A neat solution for just having an attachment point. It doesn't add a huge amount of weight or bulk. They could be adapted uh, horizontal stabiliser, maybe a future avenue of exploration, but not just now. Nothing much going on on the bottom. The protection on this is just simple clear packing tape. Um, it's good enough. Slight protection. That's good and it gets taped at the front. So that tape runs around the kind of peripheral jet angle and just keeps this all in place. It's pretty durable in my experience, it does tend to get a lot of sand jammed under it. The only thing to point out is these are the anti-torque veins and a question I've had before, a very good question, is how does this not just spin madly because you know it's a single motor design. Although the motor puts a torque, a big torque on this hull, there's counter torques to that. Um, you know, the air going out is straightened as it hits the side walls and comes down. The flaps along with the straightening veins have a lot of counter torque. These are effectively your ailerons, I guess. And, you know, a plane with a powerful motor doesn't spin, you know, inten unintentionally, because you can use ailerons to counteract the torque. It's the same kind of deal there. With a plain cylindrical duct, there is a little bit of kind of residual torque against the motor direction. Very small amount of curve there is just enough to take that out. Again, I will upload this duct and I'll have options for no veins and like various curves. Um, it's not strictly needed to be honest, but it just makes hovering on the spot a little bit better and it keeps the turning broadly equal in both directions. Without these you may find you've got better turning in one direction than the other. 
But really, that is all the counter torque swirl that you need. And any more than this will actually make it spin madly in the same direction as the propeller. A final point about the stability airflow I mentioned in the previous build video about potentially using this flow for thrust. I'll put up a quick video of an attempt at it. Is there thrust available from this? Yes. Is it significant? Not really. So, could you gain a little bit of extra th thrust with it? Yes, if you vented it this way rather than straight down. Is it really worth the complexity? I'm not sure. So, I've installed two styles of outboard wings that I've tried. So, this is now more or less a hybrid skirtless hovercraft ground effect vehicle which well the technically the first iteration of this was about eight years ago with the twin motor bixel design <laughs> the main benefit is far better pitch stability i mean the first thing i tried was just literally a plate I mean, it doesn't even have the attachment at the back, so this is a bit flimsy. If I was doing this again, I would add it. It's begging out for a side wall under here to just get a nice pocket of air under here. The issue is the same that you get with the peripheral jet kind of outer skirt, that if this was a completely rigid piece of foam, it will either get ripped off the side wall, or if you strengthen the attachment point, to the outboard wing, it will rip the outboard wing apart, and if you strengthen the outboard wing, it will just probably rip these off the hull. So as with the peripheral jet material, we'd probably go for something semi-rigid, enough to keep the air in, but also enough that, you know, if it gets caught, and it will, it will flex rather than rip this apart. So the other one, which I've only tried the once, as well as having the stronger attachment, has a, a flap on it. Now, I, in my mixing, call this an Elevon, and it sort of is. It's mixed that way, but this is an... I was picturing it more as a kind of ground effect ram flap, for, be, for lack of a better term. Where, if I had my nice vertical sidewall here, when this is down, it would trap that air far better in here, and really, really give you that ground effect lift that you want. Um, but without the, you know, the proper extension down, it wasn't really going to work. So it was set up as Elevon mixing, and I wanted is not going to fly freely, but I got it up to the very edge of ground effect. And that's kind of where I wanted it. Um, so using this as a kind of flap, kind of elevon, I'm definitely on to something. The big issue I found with yaw stability, and the, the obvious solution is just put a, a honking great vertical fin here. Doable, but you can have too much yaw stability in that the purpose, a fixed fin, the purpose of it is to keep this aligned with the oncoming airflow. Now, how do you turn this? Well, by definition, if it's moving, it needs to turn by misaligning itself with the opposite airflow. Sorry, the oncoming airflow. So, something which has happened before with my designs is maybe the yaw stability is not great. So you add a big fin and you then find it's too yaw stable and you can't actually turn the thing. 
thin you think and a movable rudder yes but then more weight more complexity more mixing yes could i just add a big vertical fin absolutely but i was thinking more along the lines of extending a, a beam back and adding a very small vertical fin and the idea is to get some level of yaw stability without having a big area sticking up because if this starts to drift sideways, and it will, that area sticking up will just roll the thing. So I'll put up a, when I'm done with this, I'll do a kind of mock-up of what I was thinking. The idea being to get your stability without adding lots of vertical area sticking up. The thing I kind of wish I'd done for the previous one is I'll actually power it up. and show the surfaces moving. I think it just kind of looks a bit better than just moving them by hand or not moving them at all. I will put up my kind of standard controls for this, which are thankfully quite straightforward compared to the, the triple motor design. But it really is just that for lift. Throttle stick being your forward control aileron. Doing your differential flaps or turning. The split flaps at the front are actually on elevator. And if you want to hold them closed, just flick. That's for pure hovercraft operation. Uh, you know, I've got a flight mode set up here. If I add the wings, uh, that does change the mixing. When I've got the Elvon wings on, I I'm using rudder to turn, uh, and then you know standard aileron. Sorry, it's not plugged in, but you know aileron elevator just does normal elevon mixing, and the front flaps then end up on that slider. Again, still tweaking it, but that's the idea. Something I have done Okay, these flaps, you know, when the throttles down close up and it's really not good to have them strained. So when it's disarmed, they're just set to open up just to relieve strain on the servo. Very quick uh, extra. The top door for accessing the battery is uh, it's kind of like a wooden well, balsa beam. Just this, nice and simple. So that comes down and locks in like so. That's what it looks like on the bottom. Very simple. It's not... Uh, it's kind of crude, but it's workable. And that's just reinforced a little bit around the outside just to give a deeper... It's not really a duct as such, but you know, a kind of intake for the for the motor propeller, I should say. Something I haven't ever talked about before, so I may as well breach the topic. These are my thoughts, it's ultimately your responsibility. So the basic rule of electric power is as soon as the battery is connected you consider the propeller to be active, assume it can spin up at any moment and act accordingly. So keep hands fingers well clear of the propeller disc and the risk only disappears when the battery is disconnected. Now, this may be good practice on an aircraft, and it is, but my designs have a bit of a conflict with how the battery is accessed. I've been in this hobby for nine years, and in that time I have had a few unexpected startups, one of which literally tore a bit of flesh off. That was certainly a learning experience. However, I've never once seen an ESC just start a motor, and that's not a contradiction. As I see it, if you don't have a throttle lockout set and you accidentally bump the throttle stick, that's not equipment failure. 
it's a setup failure. The ESC got a command to start. It started. How does it know that your fingers are in the way? Since I set up proper latching throttle lockouts and also fail safes, always check those. I've never once had an unexpected startup on any of my hovercraft. That's the sort of safety record that can lull you into a false sense of security. So is there actually no risk here? So just using this one, which is currently sitting built up with the propellers in it, if I actually go and pop the battery in, I mean, you know, it'll be kind of fiddly, and then connect it up. Now, If this unexpectedly started right now, nothing's actually going to happen. Okay, the worst little hands, it'll just come round and be slightly unpleasant. But you know, you can very easily stop this from turning, so it's actually safe, in quotes, safe. I'm not endorsing this. And that since you have to go through the propeller disc, that also means that'll stop it. Likewise, when your hand is withdrawn, you're safe, so... From one point of view, your hand's either in it and it's safe, or it's away from it and it's safe. So, it's safe. Well, life is all about edge conditions. I'm going to unplug that, because it's annoying. If your hand was just withdrawing and it spun up unexpectedly, this would spin up enough to do damage, and in doing so, this is a hovercraft that will lift. So I could see a situation where this would basically rise up and I'll take your fingers off or your nails or whatever. Um, that is actually a risk with this access to the propeller disc. Now I, personally, this is not an endorsement of this being a safe practice. The chance that this unexpectedly starts at the exact time your fingers would be in the worst possible place. I, I, I'm i okay with that risk. I'm not saying you should be, that's just my reasoning behind not having a kind of hard safety on this. What's different about putting the battery in this one is, well, you got to put it in and I usually mess about with bands and sensors and the propeller disc, you're not necessarily going to be going through that. So I'm just picturing your hands here messing about with the battery. And let's imagine this unexpectedly started. Well, a 400 watt motor, very sharp propeller blade wrist. Um, I don't think I need to elaborate why that might be a problem. So, on this one, when that's disconnected, that motor physically cannot spin up. The worst it'll do is twitch back and forth, like it's not very happy. I used to have a, like an actual switch there, but the contacts went after a while. There's probably some better switch, but that's a pretty good solution. The other quite practical thing that I haven't really talked about is waterproofing, or waterproofing in quotes. I mean, I would describe various levels of increasing water protection, but level zero is always don't run it on water. But assuming you do go ahead and run it on water, and especially salt water, it's just a matter of how much you're going to compromise the craft performance against protection. The absolute best would be full hermetic sealing for the sensitive electronics, as I've done on this airboat here. That is fully waterproof. Now, given the size of the battery in the hovercraft, it'd have to be a bigger box, and heat build up on the speed controller may be more of an issue. I definitely recommend at least a fan inside to circulate air. The servos could be installed in I don't know, 3D printed housings with a more or less waterproof bills for the push rod exit. The motor has to be exposed to cooling air. You could consider it, consider at least the bearings sacrificial. They're going to wear out. 
or get corroded sooner or later. So that would be the safest approach, but it's going to add weight and bulk. The next level up would be partial water protection, which is what I've got in this, where the receiver and the speed controller are taped up, not to make them waterproof or impervious to spray, but just to give basic protection. And I'm just accepting that the battery is open and the motor is open and the servos are quite well exposed. There is another level of waterproofing which is none because you don't need it. I might state there is no way for water to enter any of these hovercraft. Asterisk terms and conditions apply. Picture this thing hovering on water. How can any water get in? The only holes on the bottom are the stability port, which is firing out air, and the peripheral jet, which is firing out air. So there's no way for water to get inside, and indeed I've ran these designs on water for an hour and not found as much as a drop of moisture inside. You could have a situation where I know the motor fails or the battery fails while moving over water and that would just brute force scoop water up into it. But the real issue is water entering through the propeller disc and you might say, well how's that going to happen? Well here it is. It doesn't take much of a, a bounce off of even quite shallow water to send spray up and the propeller would do a fine job of spraying all that water all over the interior and this is the sort of thing that basic tape protection is really for. It's just to shrug off small amounts of spray but worst case if this thing actually flipped over on water, I think on salt water yes it's, it's a write off, everything's going to be gone unless it was fully sealed. If you really don't want to deal with it, stick to dry land, or at least fresh water is relatively harmless. Mm -hmm.